et cetera, is that they will, it will demonstrate itself that the patient actually is primarily uh, severely bipolar. And that was the reason they were using cocaine or benzodiazepines or other, um, other drugs. So it's, you know, it's important to know this. It's important to understand that these things very commonly overlap. In fact, I think it's pretty real for folks to say, I don't know how you would not have anxiety or depression uh, if you were using opioids in a severe way. Uh, I can't imagine that there would not be any of those things uh, happening. So more commonly than not by a lot, most importantly is recognizing that it'll take time to parse out what might be primary and secondary uh, and what might be um, needing to be addressed urgently. But again, on that point, you know, significant injection opioid use clearly takes precedence in regard to what needs to be addressed uh, if someone is also uh, reporting anxiety and depression of significant measure. Hope that was fairly clear for folks. Uh, I don't see any questions so far other than uh, some AV issues, but I see those are being sorted. So we'll go to the next slide. This is just a contrast. Um, again, these terms can often be confusing. They're used interchangeably incorrectly. Um, but th this is a little bit of a, uh, um, you know, briefing on how the, the two really are most commonly and most appropriately used in our patient population. Next slide, please. To talk a little bit about the numbers, uh, and this is from 2018, and I imagine in the past five years, including COVID, where we've seen a significant spike in all mental health and substance diagnoses. Uh, for obvious reasons, as well as, uh, you know, under management of chronic diseases for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, these numbers are are most assuredly more uh, impressive uh, than they, they are on this slide, so worse than, than they have been reported before. Also knowing, because of the way that diagnostics uh, criteria and diagnoses are made in the United States in our medical system, these are always underreported uh, because you don't know what you don't know. Uh, especially in regards to mental health and substance use disorder. As, as an example, you know, the commonly quoted opioid use disorder prevalence in a population is, you know, 1% to 2% maybe, uh, but we know that's way off, way underreported because of studies like that were done in Massachusetts that saw it as high as 4.5% when you really dig into the population and understand. So these are some numbers that tells you fairly clearly we have a ton of patients that have issues with comorbidities. Um, and the important point here, I think the most important point here, is all of them are actually made worse uh, by untreated um, mental health and substance use disorder. So uh, in a study that my colleague, uh, who's our um, current chief medical officer, Dr. Corey Waller, uh, did up in Michigan, they demonstrated, you know, it was over 90% of those folks who were frequent users of the emergency department for these other things, meaning diabetes, COPD, et cetera, had unmanaged a substance disorder that was complicating and exacerbating uh, their their um, organic or medical disease state. You can see at the bottom, you know, some interesting questions um, that, that definitely have to do with uh, racial disparity uh, and also sexual disparity. So folks that have comorbidities are higher among um, women and older folks. That makes sense because the body ages. Rural areas is lack of access to care, you know, those kind of things. But of course, it's also private insurance and and other folks that you see on the right here makes a lot should make a lot of sense. Uh, less you know more access, more means, uh, different socioeconomics, uh, and 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 you know less uh, lack of or a uh, differential of disparities uh, being addressed in that population. So important to note that there are disparities among populations, whether it be racial, uh, uh, gender, uh, or socioeconomic status and location. Next slide, please. It's it's important to understand these things because untreated diabetes, again, we do a really good job of treating diabetes. Well, we do a fairly, fairly good job of treating diabetes in this country, much better than we do for substance use disorder in comparison. I wouldn't say we do a great job. But the problem is when these things are under treated or untreated, it really does increase complex uh, management and cost and hospitalizations and work. So it you know, really reduces folks' ability to work and contribute to the community. And so the earlier we start to address these things, including substance use and disorder, the better. Uh, that shouldn't sound weird to anyone. Um, I'm sure folks have seen an individual who are you know, just beginning to heavily use 
drugs versus a five to 20 year history and, and their overlying uh, and interwoven medical comorbidities. And you, you know, it's not subtle, uh, the sharp decline in function, both physical and mental, when folks have long-term unmanaged substance use mental health and, and co-occurring comorbidities. Um, and it, it really does cost everyone. It costs that patient time, money, resources, uh, health, uh, most importantly, that their families have to deal with the fact that their comorbidities, et cetera, are not uh, are, are tough to manage and, and lots of appointments to deal with. Uh, it costs the insurance system and for taxpayers, of course, who pay the Medicare and Medicaid bills, it costs the taxpayer. And so not understanding that how significant these issues are is a real detriment to any community, local and more expensive, as I was describing at the you know, state tax and federal tax system level. Um, and so an example, an undermanaged diabetic, because we haven't got a hold of their bipolar and sibling use disorder, will can cost thousands and thousands of dollars a month up to if they end up in ICU, commonly with diabetic ketoacidosis, because they are not managing their diabetes, because they're too busy using drugs, alcohol, or having the mental health issues. Um, you know, those those hospitalizations be hundreds of thousands of dollars. Um, so it is detrimental to both the patient, uh, the community, and the system, uh, or all of the above. Next slide, please. These are just some common physical comorbidities. We don't have to belabor uh, these things, but, uh, you know, the, the cardiovascular leading to heart disease and associated with heart attack or myocardial infarction, stroke, all these things. These are all things that are kind of in the same chain, and they also interweave, right? So interestingly about this slide, cardiovascular and nephrological are often commonly uh, associated for our reasons because of the blood pressure is that kind of, well, can be one of the primary problems. And then even oral uh, gum disease can cause heart problems. So all of these can actually be interwoven. Next slide, please. This is what I've been talking about, uh, you know, so far, and I'm just going to keep driving this point home. You know, we, we do a lot of cases where patients fall out of treatment, either uh, of their own accord volitionally or pushed out of treatment uh, or required uh, to leave treatment for legal reasons or they go to jail. And I will tell you that the universally that what gets worse about that situation is that they're or all any of those situations is their physical comorbidities suffer, of course, because when they're in treatment, if they're on medications for opioid use disorder, as an example, and they're seeing us or, or their other, we, we have a lot of primary care reintegration that we work on, then the things that are compounded by their lack of access and integration into care are, are generally stabilized. So we get people to you know, go back and say, hey, I know I haven't really talked about uh, or been addressing my diabetes or my COPD, which is very common, of course, in substance use patients because of their smoking history, uh, above 80%. Uh, you know, I haven't really been addressing those things, but I'm more clear-minded now, uh, and I really do need to get back and see the doctor. So the slide, uh, I don't believe the slide of our outcomes is in here in regards to how we get people reintegrated into primary care, but it is a multidisciplinary um, action, right, to get folks uh, with uh, these issues and again, worsened uh, or, or more more detrimental in the folks you see here that use more than one drug are are, um, are female uh, or have you know challenging socioeconomic factors. So, you know, I guess in summary, uh, we need to recognize the differential of patients that can have these different issues that are compound a problem that's already complicated, uh, and then we need to know that not addressing them and not keeping them in treatment, not keeping them in treatment. Doesn't help anyone at any point. Next slide, please. You know, the, this is just a little bit about what the things that can happen in regards to comorbidity, physical comorbidities associated with specific drugs. Uh, I think everyone's seen folks who have chronic amphetamine used by that, you know, methamphetamines, not um, uh, Adderall and other amphetamines uh, type drugs. But, you know, that's is that still a problem, by the way. Uh, but they have significant um, oral and dental complications, which are life destroying uh, and expensive. Uh, and so, that, you know, it's, you know, we've had, I've seen personally, a lot of patients with full mouth, what they call full mouth extraction, absolutely no teeth uh, due to their chronic drug use, particularly amphetamines, methamphetamines. Uh, and the way that that works is, is um, 
uh, because of saliva, primary cause of saliva, but it's also the total care of their person. They aren't chasing meth every day and also dent, you know, flossing and brushing every day. So not surprisingly, they have these issues. Um, with chronic heroin use, that's actually even more uh, detrimental on the physical side. And I think, you know, probably I've seen the list of folks on this call. Almost everyone has seen patients in the in name your healthcare setting, hospital, emergency department, nursing home, et cetera. We've had these terrible uh, opportunistic infections, which one of the ones that hits the health care system most commonly at an acute phase is the, you know, the injection side infections. And I've taken care of uh, hundreds of those before in my emergency medicine career. But the long-term uh, related infectious disease complications with HIV, Hep B, and Hep C in particular uh, are extensively uh, problematic for both the patients and the healthcare system because of the intensity and the cost related to that. Again, great news as we've advanced a lot of our uh, medical treatments for things like hepatitis C and even HIV. Uh, once we get patients reasonably stable and can get them on to hepatitis C treatment, uh, we have a very you know upper 90s cure rate with our, with the new medications that are available that are now more uh, more available because you know insurance is coming to find that that's a, the appropriate way to to help patients. And there's even some school of thought uh, that the hepatitis C chronic inflammatory issue can uh, cause other problems, including uh, potentially uh, you know, uh, damaging the, the brain uh, um, tissue uh, because of that chronic inflammation, making it harder for the patient to you know, really gain long-term recovery because of their uh, mental uh, inclarity. So interesting stuff here. So many different kind of dynamics going on on a side that seems fairly simple, but you just got to think about that. Like, and I remember before we had curative hepatitis C treatments, and even when we started, the stigma of telling a patient you had Hep C from injecting, it's not like they didn't know that. Uh, there's enough information out there they knew that was a risk. Um, but telling them that before there was a good understanding of curative treatment was almost like a cancer diagnosis because, unfortunately, their uncle, who may have probably also had a um, substance use disorder history, you know, may or never have addressed it because the, the historical treatments uh, for Hep C were quite, uh, to be quite um uh, you know, sick, talk, uh, in, intolerant, I guess, right? to make, pick, make a person real sick. Next slide, please. I, I think I've talked about this. We're just going to review uh, just a little bit. And you see here on the right cycle of issues, and I'm going to make sure that I do address one thing that's not necessarily on this slide, but it's called out. So many folks have a primary question around, around mostly public, not usually the medical community, although we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Primary question around, well, you know, the is it their fault, the patient's fault? Is this a choice they're making? And I see the, again, the uh, designations of folks on this call. I, I doubt too many of us really believe that it's all choice because we've talked to enough patients to know they don't want to be in these situations. But the primary factors related to development of substance use disorder and mental health are very similar. So number one is genetics. Uh, nobody gets to choose their genes. Uh, you know, maybe we'll be in some weird time in the next 50 years where you get to modify your own genes, but we're not there right now. And so many gets to choose their genetics. The second criteria of the three is environment, and that is not chosen until you're past an age, which is where it's actually helpful. So most people don't get to even partially choose their environment until they're at least adolescent, late adolescence. Uh, and then a lot of damage has already been done by that time if they have adverse childhood events. And then the last, of course, is exposure which is less on the mental health development side and more on the substance use. But you can see how, given those three primary factors, you can see some of them at the bottom, that they would be very commonly uh, co-occurring, right? So if someone has severe uh, PTSD, anxiety, depression, maybe um, other diagnoses from uh, adolescent abuse or, or child abuse, uh, we shouldn't be surprised that they have a significant mental health or severe mental uh, illness uh, condition, but also an overlapping substance use disorder in order to, you know, mask the pain of that trauma. And so it's just important to know, you know, under managing these co-occurring uh, issues uh, does lead to all the things on the top left, which are terrible for the person, terrible for the community, um, and terrible for the system, the medical system, as it's already overwhelmed with these issues. Next slide, please. Actually, I, I think I saw a question pop up, and I don't mind it. We got a little time. I don't mind to grab one. I can see what the last one was. Maybe. Was it about hepatitis, I think? 
Let's see real quick here. Oh yeah, questions about how can you get B and Hep C. Mm. Yeah, it's not the only way um, that you can get Hep B and Hep C. Uh, so those can also be transmitted through other uh, means, including bodily fluid sharing. So um, sex, it, it's a lower prevalence than IV use. And the reason for that is when you have uh, something like a needle, often dirty, that has a core, it's just like HIV transmission, that has a core, that has tissue in it, you're injecting potentially somebody else's both body fluids and cellular contents into your IV, into your venous system directly. Uh, and so that is different and it has a higher rate of transmission of B and C uh, than if through bodily fluid uh, transmission such as sex. Uh, but no, it is not only uh, it is not only IV. It's just the most prevalent and, and possible. Next slide, please. I talked uh, about this a fair bit, how there's a lot of these overlapping things. And I think what's been helpful for me over the past decade of practice in the field um, is I look at this and I see patients and I talk to them and I think, you know, I, I had a pretty open mind. I wouldn't say all the way. When I was an emergency physician, Primarily, uh, I got frustrated with our, our patients, this, this patient population as well, but I had a pretty open mind after I learned more about it. It's just become more and more so over time where I look at these things and I talk about our patients, talk to our patients and about our patients. And I think, man, the, there's really not a whole lot here that someone would choose to do like that. In fact, the whole con the term, I don't use the term drug of choice. I use drug of preference because patients will often have a primary drug they're seeking but they don't choose to use it. So I don't like that term. It's not very helpful in getting folks to understand how uh, these things actually, you know, come to, to, to pass with all of these interacting risk factors. Um, and so I, I, you know, I just, I plead for folks uh, in the field to always remember. Uh, and I'll tell you the story that when my wife helped to start uh, Brightview in Cincinnati in 2015, uh, she did a first chart review. She'd read through about 30 charts uh, for one of our uh, pharma partners, and they were doing, we were doing a study with Zubzolv at that time, Rexo. Uh, and uh, she said, right after she got through those 30 charts, she said, if any of this stuff had happened to me, I would have all the issues. And it was such an astute observation of her being outside of the field. She's an infection, infectious disease specialist. So it, very interesting, uh, to be honest with you, uh, that folks really can, you can see patients in this field and think they still have a choice or make a lot they do make choices but it is not their choice to have all these issues next slide please you know what's really important about these complicated patients is absolutely uh the no wrong door principle uh and that that's because if you think about how hard it is for someone who's educated and in the field to get in to see the right person so like my wife had an ear problem lately and i had to go through all kinds of folks to get her in to see an ent that's being in the community, being a prominent physician in the community, being, you know, understanding complex systems. And that's us. So when you think about the patients with SMI, SUD, especially co-occurring and giving them a maze that looks like a labyrinth from, uh, you know, name your movie to get through that takes, you know, extensive time and they walk in any place and they're told, I'm sorry, we don't do that here. Um, that is a real problem. And it should seem pretty logical from the example I just gave. And so one of the things that we've worked on for years, but still have a lot of road uh, to, to, to drive on this, is these collaboration between all of the organizations because Brightview doesn't do everything, you know? Uh, and need, no, no um, entity, I think, does. I mean, you know, I've worked for some of the largest health systems in the country, uh, and still there'll be gaps either in their system or gaps in their local uh, availability. And so these kind of things um, are essential and then the understanding that the patient's disease state does cause them to, by definition, achieve less compliance with their developed treatment plan. And I would venture to say I mean, the first person to raise their hand and tell me they took every medication they were supposed to for the past 90 days, I'll give them $100 because that's not reality. And so we shouldn't be surprised that our patients um, have, uh, you know, issues navigating this complex system, which is discombobulated, particularly related to mental health, particularly related to substance use disorder and the co-occurring even more so. And so we do try to do that wrong, no wrong door. So 
that doesn't mean we can take care of everything in Brightview. You know, we're, we are growing to, to add co-occurring treatment. We're trying to grow to add more infectious disease treatment. Um, but the reality is, uh, you know, this takes a, it takes a village is, is an absolute truth here uh, where we need as much communication as possible. And at no time, uh, in, as far as I know, uh, that that Brighty has you know been been obstructive in trying to communicate with folks. I think sometimes uh, in our community uh, relationships, we do have to m abide by um, compliance of different of a lot of things. It's quite crazy actually how big our compliance department is. We have to abide by uh, confidentiality rules, which is a slide later. And so sometimes it might seem that there's a lack of communication, but it's never intentional. Uh, we really uh, absolutely understand. Um, the challenges related to getting this done. I did say that question or comment pop up about complex patients in rural areas. I, I'm from the middle of Kentucky, so I already know. Uh, it's absolutely true. Uh, you know, we're we're using we meaning Brightview, we the medical system are are working on that with telehealth, but that's a whole different lecture. Um, and you know, it's it's I think times are changing, uh, but that's not creating any more uh, specialists. So it's just kind of trying to expand their their reach. Uh, and then you have things in places where, you know, my family's from in eastern Kentucky, uh, where there's literally no internet. So telehealth is not is a non conversation. That being said, it is a good tool uh, and it's really helpful uh, for folks to be able to use that, use the technological systems at, at, at hand, use things like prescription digital therapeutics, which is a technology on most smartphones that can really help patients maintain their um, their sobriety and their attendance. I mean, again, my calendar runs my life, uh, and I, you know, I try to abide by that, but I also need reminders, and I, and I get texts from different appointments. You have a dental appointment, blah blah blah. So the more we can help folks really understand their treatment plan, their other treatment uh, for co-occurring or comorbidities, and manage them, and that's why case management, care coordination, uh, and and and, and uh, social work is so important for these patients. You know. Uh, just getting their transportation can be a fairly substantial positive. Uh, that's a really important slide, so I'm going to stop there for a second and make sure I covered everything. But you know, it's it's probably the other, other most important point behind drug of preference. Uh, let's move on to the next slide. Please. Saw that question pop up by Ms. Burgess. I'll address it now. You know, so the way that I address uh, harm reduction is actually a little bit specific. It's something I um, believe in. Absolutely. I mean, it, you know, we were able to get new laws in the state of Ohio for needle exchange uh, by calling it something else. And we have, you know, we do, Brightview's contributed to and done some of the most massive Narcan distributions in the history of the United States. Um, but really what I talk to folks about is I'm obligated by my Hippocratic oath, as well as medical legal risk factors to do the best things for patients at all times that I can. And that is keeping them in treatment. So it is, it became very clear and then very bizarre to me that I would be in the emergency department and see a COPD patient who won't quit smoking, which is a substance use disorder, by the way, uh, they won't quit smoking um, and see them for the fifth time for lighting their oxygen tank on fire on their face or their oxygen tubing on fire on their face for smoking. And I never once degraded or turned that patient away or gave them a pamphlet for COPD and said, good luck, like we do for patients with opioid use disorder. And so for me, I, when I talk to, it doesn't matter who, or, you know, it could be another physician, it could be a parent, it could be a judge. Um, I just talk about what I have to do uh, from, a, from a physician standpoint. And a, and a provider, and you could be a therapist, it doesn't matter, social worker, from a professional treatment standpoint, I have to abide by my oath to take good care of patients, uh, and as well as the fact that I'm medically at risk. And, it, you know, and that almost always aligns with harm reduction is how I address that uh, primarily. Secondarily, I did see the comment, and I agree with you, you can't treat people that are dead. That is an impossibility. You know, we when if you don't give them a chance to stay around, they can't be around uh, to receive treatment. Uh, you know, in recovery and we contribute to their family and community. So, you know, I feel very strongly about that. Uh, obviously, but 
in in reality for me it's pretty black and white uh and i don't say that very often I'm, I'm a very complex thinker so i don't often think things are binary but i'm obligated to do the best thing for my patients and because the evidence tells me most commonly that that's staying in treatment and if they have specifically oud staying on medication for opioid use disorder that's indefensible not to practice that way from a physician or medical provider standpoint because the evidence is overwhelming decades of it plus hundreds of thousands of humans in different studies saying so uh, and so I, I have to abide by that because if i were on the opposite side of that medical legal case and i asked a physician hey did you just you know stop their treatment because you know you were mad at them that day or whatever or they weren't abiding by your treatment plan perfectly which as i described no one does no one does <laughs> um that then you know you let them you discard you uh, dispense, excuse me, uh, dismiss them from treatment because of you know some measure of non-compliance uh that's medical legal liability right off the bat so that's how i address that question i have to do it i have to um act in, in the in the interest of, of harm reduction bridging the gap uh we you know rural access to medical care is not something bright is going to solve i will say and, and proudly so that over the past almost a decade now uh we have been able to establish a lot of care through both um opening new uh, treatment sites as well as virtual meaning digital or telehealth better access is it perfect absolutely not you know there are still a lot of places my wife in fact when she was in nursing school did a um rural health care uh uh elective on um in the in the Appalachian area of eastern Kentucky where they literally had to ride horses uh to get to the patients and they are not those patients are still you know have a lack of care so I think though that you know looking at the positive side of the increased availability you know and Brightview striving to get when we're in a in a community in a state uh we try to expand to the point where we serve as many members of that state as we possibly can and the obstructions to that are many including the affordability uh meaning a lot of insurance doesn't cover things appropriately the insurance companies i'm not sure if there's any folks work for the payers on this particular um uh, forum but you know the, the the services are often underpaid or blocked or the systems of getting reimbursed are complicated or the patient can't get on insurance so the affordability part of this is critical uh and that overlap uh, excuse me also coincides with um the rules so folks if any of the folks on this call are on the, what I would describe the rulemaking side, meaning the, the state or federal legislative side or boards of medicine or boards of pharmacy, et cetera, the more complicated the rules are that aren't aligned with good clinical care. And the American Society of Addiction Medicine does a great job of providing tons of content for folks to understand. If the rules aren't aligned, then it makes sense the folks, the patients um, would suffer at the end of the day. So if, as an example, uh, I tell people quite often why they're looking at expanding methadone access federally is because the rules in many states are that you have to attend a clinic 90 days, first, excuse me, six days a week, every day for the first 90 days. I'm generalizing a little bit, but that's pretty much how it works. And I said to people, I, we got to look at that. I understand the dangers of methadone and the, and the downside and the risks, um, but there we haven't seen substantial um, uh, negatives with the expansion of methadone during the COVID relaxation of rules. Uh, and I just think to myself, uh, it's not a whole lot of patients that can show up six days a week for 90 days. Uh, you know, I don't think I could. In fact, I know I couldn't. Um, and so, you know, understanding the reimbursement and rules uh, is, a, is a way to bridge the gap and advocating for what I would describe as kind of common sense uh, related to those things. Uh, whether no matter what forum you might be in. There are the health screenings, obviously, you know, the more we can put uh, substance use disorder and mental health screenings into the general medical system to to, to find them earlier. Uh, I often use the analogy that the way we commonly treat substance use disorder in this country is, is it as if we let every diabetic have to get an amputation before we address their diabetes. That's ridiculous, but in reality, by the time a person is injecting heroin five times a day, uh, they are basically, you know, perform, you know, uh, in line with a uh, diabetic getting ketoacidosis or amputation. So that's not the way we address things in the rest, in the rest of medicine. It shouldn't be here. Next slide, please. We talked about this. Um, the reason I'm not going to give 
absolute specifics is because these these are complicated. You you should just generally right know the HIPAA rules um, if you're in any environment, and that there are HIPAA plus or rules that are more uh, specific now uh, to folks that have substance use disorder but to protect their identity and their medical information. And so learn the rules in your state. They are different sometimes. Uh, they're primarily federal, so HIPAA compliance and uh, CFR 42 Part 2 uh, and the modifications that have occurred over the past year, few years are generally federal, but there can also be state specifics um, in regards to um, things like the state, the uh, prescription medical uh, program or PMP or, or record uh, in the states that I'm sure folks are familiar with. Ohio is ORS, Kentucky is CASPER, Indiana is INSPECT, that kind of thing. So that folks are familiar that there's other data uh, associated with our patients in recovery uh, that can get out there, uh, and and folks talking, you know, being uh, indiscriminate with sharing that data can be real problematic, and it is complicated. Uh, my colleague at ASAM, Kelly Corridor, is a phenomenal advocate for patients um, with substance use disorder. Um, lobbies constantly uh, to be careful with this, so it is a balance between folks. Uh, who are trying to communicate about a patient and texting is never appropriate unless it's HIPAA compliant, uh, as an example. But, you know, trying to balance the communication between ourselves, whether they be a medical professional, legal professional, et cetera. And so these confidentiality rules need to be very well understood and carry risks, both legal and um, uh, other for the patients. Next slide, please. Uh, just a little bit more about, you know, the things that we do, uh, that some of which are unique. Uh, we are working on co-occurring. I already mentioned that. No, no reason to belabor that. We, we know what co-occurring is, and we know how common it is, and we are working very tire tirelessly to expand those services. I'm sure folks understand. We do not have enough psychiatrists, psych NPs, et cetera, not we, Brightview, we, the country. Uh, and so that's a real barrier is a workforce, but we're we're constantly evaluating how to improve that. Our access, I think I'll say is second to none. Um, when we first started Brightview and we said, we're gonna see people same day, next day with a 24 seven hotline, you know, such and so on, same day medications and such, that was a foreign concept in 2015. Most of the providers in our area and even outside of the area said, there's no way you're gonna do that. That's not possible, blah, blah, blah. Uh, we disagreed and we've maintained that philosophy ever since. Does that mean, we're perfect at it, absolutely not. Uh, you know, we, we do accept walk-ins, as you can see at the top here, but specifically, we are not doing mental health only diagnoses, which is pretty uncommon uh, that folks don't have some sort of substance use uh, issue. But, you know, it is important to know we don't do primarily psychiatric services, but our access for both primary SUD and co-occurring patients, I believe, is second to none. And, and you know, the, the reason we've been rolling out some measure of co-occurring psychiatric dis services is because we couldn't really find them elsewhere or our patients wouldn't go elsewhere, which is an interesting thing when you get trust built with a certain provider organization. One of the things on controlled substances, this question's always come up. So if you're treating co-occurring, you know, anxiety, depression, opioid use disorder, ADHD, um, uh, bipolar, whatever. Um, and the answer is we have a lot of very smart providers who extensively think through the risks and benefits of different controlled substances. That does not mean if someone has a history of substance use disorder, they may not be on a controlled substance. Obviously, buprenorphine and methadone are controlled substances. If someone has severe anxiety disorder, uh, and the general, generally the evidence is not good for long-term benzodiazepines, but we have to deal with it. What do I mean by that? Um, it may be a short to medium-term thing where we're dealing with their uh, very, very severe anxiety uh, disorder, but at the same time, if the patient comes to us with long-term benzodiazepine use, they can't just cut off. It doesn't work physically or mentally. Uh, and so, if the if an external resource sees us prescribing these controlled substances, uh, trust me when I say that is the our least favorite thing to do. But we will do it uh, when it's the right and necessary thing for the patients. Uh, and we like to you know we'll try to document and explain that to folks that have questions, whether it be the patient parent, uh, probation officer, et cetera. So it's just important to know, especially with co-occurring disorders, you might see patients on a few different things. And in all honesty, if they're only taking the medications we're prescribing, 
even if two of them are controlled, that is a win uh, because the patient is not doing all the other things that they were they're doing prior to. Next slide, please. I was actually reviewing this uh, deck this morning and I took a screenshot of this um, to send it to my wife who's been on this ride uh, for over a decade uh, with me. And it just, it's really meaningful um, to go through these things and look what people are saying about their recovery, their treatment. It's also a little sad uh, to be honest with you, but it does, you know, folks that treat this population understand Things like, I am no longer a disappointment. Well, that's a little bit, that's both positive and negative that that was even a statement. Um, but the fact that they're reliable, trusted, motivated, that is really uh, profoundly effective. And that's what we hope to do. And that's why we're here today talking about co-occurring disorders and comorbidities, both, um, is because these are the things you want to see happen. We want to see people get back to work and health. Um, and that requires uh, often uh, a multidisciplinary approach to their to their care, uh, so it's it really is good to to see these things. And I know we have hundreds, thousands of more attestations uh, from folks, and I've heard them myself. Um, but it it's you know it's a it's a road uh, that, that you have to walk down. It's it, uh, if we had a magic wand and I said, hey, we just use this one thing or this one therapy, and it does it for everybody every time, I'd be ecstatic. That is not reality, uh, and so it's a work in progress. Uh, I, I think Ted Lasso said last night on the latest episode, uh, work in prog progress, my new favorite phrase. Uh, I think that's really applicable to, unfortunately, a lot of our patients. But a work in progress uh, is, is reality for a lot of folks. And then seeing these kind of affirmations along their recovery journey is really helpful. We're going to take uh, time now to get to a few questions. And I'll, if you want to read them, that'd be great. Yes, yeah, we have one. Um, has anyone looked into organizing facilities or programs that focus on comorbidities? I constantly struggle finding effective treatment for clients with medical conditions, other mental health diagnoses while needing treatments for SUD. Yeah. Let me try to parse that out a little bit. Uh, most states have a designation, uh, as an example, Tennessee, uh, of don't do co-occurring. We're just talking about just about mental and substance use disorders, right? Right for a second. If don't do both, there's a designation for do it somewhat, and there's a do it, you know, at an exceptional level. And those are co-occurring. They often are CO something, CODC or CODE, and those designations are often seen in state um, certified facilities. Like like most of Brightviews have state licenses. I think probably all of the Brightviews have state licenses. So if you know the state licensure system of your state, you can learn those criteria, those acronyms, those designations, and at least understand that doesn't mean high quality, but it is a, like a ceiling, it's a floor. If they've gotten certified to do a certain level of care, um, that can be a, a benefit. On the comorbidity side, that's more of a challenge. I have not seen too many. I think you know, some of the JCO certifications, et cetera, can... can uh, Designate folks that do that. I really haven't seen much. I could be ignorant to that, but I do read a lot. I don't think there's a ton out there. What we've done at Brightview, you know, part of it is because a lot of our staff are medical physicians and addiction physicians, and then or psychiatrists and primary care. So those kind of things. Um, for our nurse practitioners, we're emergency nurse practitioners or family nurse practitioners, etc. Um, we do, we tend to take a lot more of those comorbidities at least in the short term on, and then try very hard to refer those folks to either primary or specialty care to manage their comorbidities. That's obviously as complicated as we've talked about today. I am unfamiliar and welcome any information from folks on a designation or a system that helps individuals find a facility that does comorbidities well, unless it's a healthcare system-based uh, provider uh, or a very developed uh, residential and an outpatient provider that they really sought to do that well. Uh, and that's a real problem. It is still a reality today that even we will send, I have a double boarded emergency addiction specialist sending a patient to hospital for alcohol withdrawal, having done all of the work uh, to know that patient needs to be admitted and they'll get rejected from the emergency department or from hospital admission. So more commonly than not, unfortunately, the comorbidities question is not well addressed. Any other 
written questions we should do? Yes, yeah, there's some, some comments as well as questions. Uh, I too struggle with explaining to community members the need for risk reduction programs. People always ask me, when do you give up? And I answer, when they're not breathing anymore. I get burnt up when uneducated people act like these clients, patients don't matter. So uh, some empathy there. Um, and there was one from someone that actually other folks are helping answer as well. Uh, her name's Rachel, and it's with harm reduction and the use of social workers, case managers, peers being so important. How do we move sites forward in hiring a peer? Uh, I know that she's she's put forward for volunteer peers. She's still waiting on a response. Peers and and B require 500 hours of volunteer time, waiting on compliance to guide me. Yeah. So. Each state, uh, you know, so peer supporters actually have a long history. It's interesting. I'll try to find the article and send it back to my colleagues for distribution. But um, peer support systems are actually not new. Uh, meaning the state's certification of certain peers is not new. Um, it it is uh, thirty or forty years in some states history of license. I would say licensure or certification of certain peers. Uh, it, it's a little bit of a tough balance. Um, and so my request is for folks that are involved in the licensure certification system in each state to, again, me uh, take a measure of common sense, which can mean sometimes being a little more open-minded to peers, uh, having, a, you know, a, 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 as an example, in some states, it's hard to be a Medicaid provider if you have a felony. And that, we're not going to go all the way down that rabbit hole. I think people can understand that. And so... Um, working on those rules and certifications to get them more aligned across multiple states is helpful. Also, being open minded in the peer uh, support uh, mechanisms, whether they be virtual, digital, meaning on an app, uh, or in person, and, and a combination of all, of course, is, is best case. Um, but there are some, you know, the states are always discussing this, the, the regulatory agencies I'm involved in. And it's some measure of concern because the opposite has also been true. And I, it happened right in Hamilton County where I started practicing, where someone would have probably, you know, maybe six weeks to six months of recovery, and they'd been thrust into a peer support role, sometimes somewhat um, abusively, meaning like paying them very poorly, uh, you know, and, and exchanging them for treatment, which is not appropriate and then so oftentimes illegal. Uh, and so there was some there's some measure of concern that over the past similar period of 30 or 40 years of these systems and folks being actually certified, obviously, peer support is a hundreds of year old concept, not thousands. Uh, but that, you know, that folks would you know take advantage of the peers. And that's, of course, wrong. Um, but you, some providers would, would put them in situations. You know, it's hard enough for those of us who don't have a history of substance use disorder to deal with the challenges of patients uh, and. And to do it very early in one's recovery it has to be managed appropriately, meaning probably professionally guided by the therapist who's taking care of the patient or something like that. So great question, a little complicated. I think that the answer is generally that peer support is phenomenally effective when done well with the right education. I will make one caveat. I have seen a program that was actually shut down. They were testing, sending folks as peer supporters with limited education on medications uh, versus those who had a fairly extensive education on on the medical side of, of specifically OUD treatment. Those who were undereducated on medications uh, actually caused the patients harm, uh, interestingly, but also terribly, because they didn't know enough to not to know what to talk about positive or negative, and they just heard the, some of the negatives. And if that person had gotten through recovery through A or NA, which is absolutely great, uh, they may have a particular uh, opinion on medications. Uh, and the problem with that uh, is that um, medications are complicated enough to send people to medical school for de a decade. Uh, it really shouldn't, you know, necessarily we should, uh, the answer from in the peer environment should be, I know there's evidence, good evidence for this. You should talk to a medical provider. Uh, not really giving necessarily weighted opinions on the topic unless they're really educated. I mean, we have some pharmacists and physicians who are in recovery who, who operate as peer supporters, of course. So um, this is, you know, it's a, it's a balance. Uh, I think overall, you know, almost every patient we've seen has um, has benefited from good guided peer support. Next question. Okay. Do you accept behavioral addiction clients with co-according 
co-occurring disorders and provide them treatment. Do we, I'm sorry, do we say, I think I Do you accept behavioral addiction clients with co-occurring disorders and provide them treatment? Uh, I'm not sure that if I understand the term behavioral addiction correctly. I think I do, but I don't know what the example is. Ah, gambling. Yeah. Uh, no, we don't primarily. Uh, Mary, we don't primarily accept patients with gambling. I thought that might be the question. Um, because I'm sure you're aware, a lot of gambling patients actually have at least one substance use disorder, often the same ones. Um, and so, in that case, we would try to address their kind of co-occurring issues as best we could. Okay. Um, we have a comment here and another question. Um, in Ohio, we need advocacy at a state level around licensing boards, uh, chemical dependency, social work, clinical counselors, and someone else commenting uh, as far as programs, would a federally qualified health center be a good fit for this? So the, the first question is there are advoc there are strong advocates in Ohio, uh, permanently the Ohio Council uh, is the group that we um, align with and they do a really good job, I think it's tough. Uh, Teresa Lample is, I think, the CEO of that, if you're unfamiliar, in Ohio. There's also a ton of other advocacy groups in Ohio, and we're actually really fortunate. Uh, I will say that Brightview was almost spoiled uh, having developed primarily in Ohio because the system is pretty robust. And you go into other states that we're in now, Kentucky, my home state, still a lot of challenges and issues uh, from rules, reimbursement, you name it, uh, and some of the other states as well. So. Ohio has a pretty good advocacy environment. If you want to get involved through the Ohio Council uh, is one way and there's multiple other groups. The second question for FQHC is, is it depends. Um, and I, I think that I've been part of some efforts over the past decade, um, supported by different uh, federal legislative efforts, like the support act and whatnot. We're really developing services in an FQHC uh, has been a primary focus. I've seen it done very well and I've seen it done very poorly. And the difference was two things, a commitment to understanding how complicated uh, substance use and co-occurring, et cetera, can be in the patients uh, in that environment, uh, as well as a, a medical provider champion. So if those two things are in place, that the, that the FQHC's local and larger leadership uh, understand that this is a commitment, you don't just learn how to prescribe buprenorphine and it's all good. That's not at all correct. By the way, it's a lot more complicated than that. Uh, and then having a medical provider champion makes all the difference in the world um, as a person who's kind of that lead. And in that case, you know, FQHC can be a great resource uh, and they are, you know, they're reimbursed to do so. They are um, allowed to do so. The other part of it that I will insert is that we look at the whole continuum of care and we have millions and millions of people that need treatment that aren't getting it or are getting it now, they have to transition through a continuum at some point. And so it is not good for a patient to stay, as an example, under the guidance of a triple boarded addiction psychiatrist medicine physician for a, you know years, seeing them every month or or maybe a little less frequently later, if they could be managed by a, a you know, primary care physician at FQHC. Uh, and so that part of the continuum for those stable patients stabilized patients uh, is something that FQHCs can really fill a gap uh, and necessarily so uh, because we just don't have enough of the high intensity providers. Uh, I'm gonna go, unless there's one more important comment, I'm gonna go ahead and close out so we stay on time. Um, this has been, you know, I talked about it before. Um, I think, you know, people say, well, that, you know, they need to get ready to get treatment when they're ready. That's a little bit more, intricate of a comment. Um, we have a 24 hour 7 access center because we do believe that. But I want to make sure folks don't think that means that they, they quote, have to be ready. I, I will finish with a fortunate story that happened last summer. I was at, I was in Louisville at the Thunder event, Thunder of Louisville event. I had a colleague who knew me said, uh, yeah, you know, really sorry to tell you, we had a friend die who was a physician, but he wasn't ready to get treatment for his alcohol use disorder which exacerbated substantially during COVID, not surprisingly. And in fact, is relative to this slide right here about compassion, fatigue, and, you know, and, and burnout. That particular physician was burnt out, was dealing with COVID, uh, and ended up drinking himself to death. And my friend said, well, we didn't call up you or 
tell anybody or we didn't think he was ready. Uh, and I said, man, I really wish we weren't having this conversation uh, because it is, you know, any glimpse you have of helping somebody when you don't think they're ready. And again, most people making that assessment don't even know what readiness means or the stages of change or anything. Um, I just always advocate for folks to say that is not the right way to look at it. You don't have to have someone beating your door down saying, help me to help them. Sorry. Okay. Well, thank you for your time, Dr. Ryan. We thank everybody for joining us. Um, as you can see on the screen here, our next virtual forum will be on May 10th from 12 to 1, and we will be talking about compassion fatigue. And if we did not get to your questions, we will follow up with you after uh, this event. And we really appreciate everyone's time. Have a great day.